Great. OK, yes. thanks. Good afternoon, everybody, and you're all very welcome to the first QCN event of 2022. Um, and it's really great to see such a fantastic turnout this afternoon. We've actually got over 250 people registered to attend this afternoon's event from 60 different organizations across the public service. And, you know, I'm kind of waiting for the event where I don't get to announce new members are an increase in numbers but every time that number just keeps rising and it's really fabulous and i think that's just a tribute to the members of the network and everything that people are contributing in terms of sharing your knowledge and expertise that it's become there's such a such a vibe around the network that it really encourages people to come and join so i hope as i say any of the new members this afternoon um find it a useful and engaging event and you'll stick with us so special welcome this afternoon to new members from munster technological university from the department of this is the one i always struggle with children equality disability integration and youth also some new people from dsp from the nsso the national shared services office and from the citizens information board so you're all very welcome to join us we have a really interesting lineup of speakers this afternoon um we have marie o'hare from the hse we have Catherine McGuigan, who's the Chief Officer of Age Friendly Ireland, and we have Cormac Halpin, who's a Senior Statistician from the CSO. The event this afternoon is running on WebEx. Um, I'm sure over the last two years, everybody's familiar with WebEx, among the many other Skypes, Zooms, whatever else you've been using. So basically, you will be muted as, as an audience member. You will be muted throughout um, but you will have the opportunity to contribute questions through the question and through the, the dialogue box that you'll find on your screen. Um, you can do that while each of the speakers is making their presentation. Um, and but we'll also have a more open Q&A session at the end. But certainly don't feel you need to keep your questions bottled up the, to the end. Pop them in as we're going along and we can put some of them immediately to the speakers when they're finished. Um, this afternoon, the event is all about taking action on accessibility and really focusing on very much, as is the nature of this network, on practical issues and really in this practical approaches to engaging our customer base. Very much follows on from the themes of a lot of last year's events and particularly where we culminated in the annual conference with that focus on digitalization for all. And I suppose, again, that important reflection on the fact that I think in all of our various organizations, in one shape or another, we're about the process of redesigning our service models, redesigning our customer integration. And typically, digital has become the dominant mechanism. It's enormously efficient, it reaches people, but it also brings that accessibility challenge that it's awfully, awfully easy to leave people behind in that journey to digitalization. So the concept of accessibility for all, the principles of universal design, they're more important than ever. And this afternoon, we're going to hear some very, very practical presentations on issues that really touch the entire population of the country. Um, and this, so this goes to the heart of what we as public servants are all about. My, Mary O'Hare is going to be talking to us about the change framework within the HSE. And again, if you think about it, the HSE as an organization is one that ideally, if we live a long and happy life in really good health, we'll have very little engagement with. Reality is that nearly all of us have some engagement with the health services throughout our lives. So again, it's enormously important in terms of its impact on us. <laughs> Catherine McGuigan then is the Chief Officer from Age Friendly Ireland, and she's going to be talking about their work in making access a reality. And again, if you think about the scale of this, age is something we all aspire to. Let's face it, nobody's rushing towards the alternative. So it's something that again affects the entire population of the country. And then our final speaker this afternoon, Cormac Halpin, who's a senior statistician from the CSO, is going to be talking to us about the census, which is going on at the moment. And again, this is something that affects the entire population. And there's some really interesting challenges if you look at the changing nature and structure of our population and how to make the census accessible to all. Um, and that's the only way to ensure that the results, of course, are relevant to all. And obviously, there's a huge diversity of people across the country uh, just dropping us all a form and expecting us all to fill it in. As good public servants, we're all comfortable with filling in forms that does translate into the needs of every citizen. So there are challenges there, and it'll be really interesting to hear from that. 
So as I say, we're going to begin off with Marie and Marie is organization development and change practitioner at the HSC and she's going to introduce their change framework. And this it's a comprehensive framework to ensure that the needs of customers are at the center of any organizational or service change. So I think this is going to be very relevant for all of us. Particular focus on, and again, a common theme of this network, understanding user needs. And of course, accessibility is the heart of this. So Marie will discuss how the framework can be used and how it can be adapted to any of our organizations and provide us with practical examples of how this has within the HSE delivered accessible services. So, Marie, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Breen, and, and good afternoon to everybody and greetings from the West of Ireland. I'm talking to you from um, Ballinrobe, County Mayo, and, um, and I suppose um, this is the nature of work at the moment uh, in the HSE. Uh, for those of us who aren't on the front line of the services, we can uh, work remotely as well. Um, but unfortunately, I'm just coming out of COVID. So <laughs> I'm still, I'm just, today is my first day out of isolation. So I'm glad to be with you all here today. So um, just, I'm going to share um, my slide deck with you. And uh, I believe this is going to be made available to you afterwards. And, um, and like, and for those of you who hate PowerPoints, um, let me just say that <laughs> I'm not going to be talking to every single slide to you. OK, um, but really, I'm just going to focus on what it is we're trying to do in the HSC in relation to engaging um, the public and our service users um, and how we design and deliver our services. And more importantly, my job in the service is to support the leaders and the clinicians and all the workers of the different various services that we have to manage change and service improvement in a way that involves the service user and involves staff in it. So that's kind of what my job is uh, within the health service. Um, my background is I started in health services way back in 1986 as a nurse. And I suppose I, I, a change has been in my life since I went into the health services. I started in the Richmond Hospital, which closed. And one night I was on night duty in the Richmond and the next night I was on night duty in Beaumont. So <laughs> it was, uh, and I was all of 18 years of age. <laughs> So change has been part and parcel of my career to date, and I've diversified and moved through the whole nursing field into change management, into working in HR, and now I'm working with services um, in trying to evolve and develop the, the service in a way that's accessible and practical for you, anybody in the service, anybody in the public who wants to access services. So as you can feel from my voice, I'm very passionate about what it is that we do. And, you know, for all our flaws, nobody in the health service goes out to do harm. We all go to do the best. Unfortunately, we're a human service, so mistakes do happen. But what's really important for us in the service is that we try and adapt and use. And I think we've proven that in the last two years, how we've stepped up to mark to deal with COVID and to put everything into that focus to keep us safe and well. So very quickly, I suppose the whole session that I have, and I've all of 10 minutes, so I'm going to be flying through these, and is really just to how it aligns, how our guide, the change guide, our change framework, how it actually helps deliver services and the front line. So very, very quickly, without getting too much into this slide, there's a lot of things we have to be aligned to. So the service uh, in the HSE has, and I know, Breen, you were talking about 60 organizations now part of the network. There are over 300 different types of services in the HSE. So you can imagine the amount of complexity that the health service has. And while we have an overriding government focus on slauncher care within the HSE service itself and within our corporate plan, we are trying to bring all our various families, if I can put it together, and our family members with a focus on how do we keep the service practical and accessible to the person in their own home and keep them at home and keep them well. So my next slide is very much what's in our corporate plan. And our aim is that you get the right care at the right time in the right place and that you feel listened to and safe. 
and that we work as a team and that you can trust us and that we support you to live well and connect it with your community. So we take healthcare not just as acute services, not just as community <laughs> services, but as you as a whole person. So how are we trying to do this? I suppose what we're trying to do is align all our collective actor, all our collective efforts and build our relationships and networks. And I suppose unleash our existing resources, which we never have enough of because we need more people and there's more demands. And the health service is often described as an endless pit because the demands outweigh the supply. However, we do the best we can within the resources that we have, that we meet the needs of the most important people, the people who need us at the given time. OK, and within that, our staff are really important because we're a human service. So therefore, anything we do in relation to change and implementing our services, we must have that collective leadership among ourselves and be ready to change and to be ready to adapt and be agile to support whatever it is that's required from us. So if I was to look at what it is my service is doing, what we're trying to do is, I suppose, take the complexity into some simple steps and simple rules and, and gather the guidance in one place. So we do have supports in our system to support, and I'll talk a little bit this, about this at the very end of the presentation, and the guides. And we have e-learning programs and we have mentorship and we have, and we have clinics where we offer some coaching and we offer a whole load of educational opportunities but at the end of the day I suppose how do we bring it to life and that's about working with all our leaders in the system and when I mean our leaders I'm meaning all our staff <laughs> in our system because they're all leaders and because whether it is the public health nurse going into the home whether it is the community psychiatric nurse working in the CAM service, whether it is the consultant uh, geriatrician working with his multidisciplinary team or whether it is our oncology services, there is always change going on and there's always a person or someone who is requiring us to support them in their health journey. I suppose the other aspect of our work is that we're trying to keep everybody healthy and well. So we have a whole aspect of working with community groups. We've been working very closely with our local health authorities and um, with other voluntary organisations and this whole area of, and I'm sure our, our other speakers talk about social prescribing, which is a new kind of terminology that's coming into place. But really, it's about building networks and connections so that if I'm living in a community, I know where the active retirement group is. I know if there's a little exercise program going on, I know how I can access my GP. I can know how I can ask my family resource centre. It's about all of those community resources that we can tap into and maybe even how my local GA club can support me in keeping well and and involved in my community. So as you can see from this slide and just very quickly because it's a nice visual, it's people's needs defining change. So it's not change for the sake of change, it's for change so that it improves what the quality of my life might be, what the quality of my engagement with the people that I'm serving might be. And as you can see, there is about having tools, the power and the trust to do that in a safe and effective way. And again, I'm not because the literature says this, and I suppose our framework has very much, because in the health service, we take evidence as something that's really very important in how we deliver our care and how we deliver our service. So it's really important that it's research based. So we did get um, Trinity to work closely with us in reviewing all the literature from business and from healthcare to design the framework that would enable us to deliver change effectively. So this is the framework. <laughs> it might look very simple, but at the very, very bottom of it, it talks about people and cultural platform. And that is about us being engaged with having a shared vision, knowing what it is we were about, having the collective leadership, understanding personal experiences. So what might be needed in Mayo may not be needed up in St. Michael's Estate in Inchicore in Dublin. 
which I worked in as a public health nurse, very, very different, the needs. So we have to be able to adapt and to uh, give the appropriate support and care in those places. And we need to be able to engage those community and how we design the service for that, that area. So that whole area of co-production and human design is really important. And then the upper piece there is always about and, and, and in healthcare, and I was speaking to one of the managers the other day who said, Marie, I found the, the framework really useful, she said, in developing a breastfeeding program. And I said, what? She said, because I was straightway going into the doing of it. And I forgot about the preparing and setting the foundation, engaging with the mothers that needed us, engaging with my colleagues who were going to be supporting them. And she found by engaging with her colleagues and with the mothers that she was delivering with, the programme that she delivered was found and they were able to deal with COVID and still deliver the service. So I suppose what we're really looking at is that when we're in the actual activity, and again, the slides has all the information, I don't need to talk it through with you, but it gives you frameworks, it gives you, we have templates, it gives you the best practice for you to do your thinking with the people that you're working alongside. What's really important for us to know now in 2022 is the old way of doing things, of telling people what it is they should be doing doesn't work anymore. We know that, we know the research says that. We know our own colleagues that we work alongside and the next generation of healthcare worker will want that whole value-based approach to work, will want to build relationships, will want to be agile, will want to be connected with what's happening and that shared vision. So it's really important that we move to this new way of working. So we need to discover what is it that people need, what's technically feasible, what's financially feasible, and work with one another to do that. And so in order to do that, we need to be able to engage and so we need to map out and define needs, tailor to the groups that we're working with, engage with the purpose and then sustain it, test it out, sustain it and put the resources into it. And this is a really important slide. If I was to say if there's anything that's really helpful across any service that you do, when you're thinking about involving and improving and engaging with people, think about who is important? And so this particular stakeholder mapping tool looks at, you know, who do we need to keep fully engaged? Who do we need to keep increased engagement with? Who do we just need to communicate with? So this particular slide here really just outlines kind of the pyramid of what it is we're trying to do. And not everybody needs to be involved in everything, but it's important that if we want to try and build that power sharing, that trust, we must participate, collaborate and work in partnership. And for us in the system, that's what we're trying to do in a very small team working with over 120,000 people in the services. So like that, we're trying to make sure we have e-learning programs. We have um, a change guide and action session, which I'm running tomorrow myself in the service. And really it's telling the story of our colleagues who have used it in changing and delivering services. But what's really important and a bit like here today, it's a community of practice. It's a community of sharing our learning and that we scale up and we develop that learning. And I suppose these are just our, our slides that are there for you of resources that we have available and it's on HSE Net and you can tap into them and use them. And our contact details are here and I've left my contact details for us all. And I suppose one thing I would say to everybody is, you know, if I was to ask you something major was going to change in your life in the morning, whether it be your health or your work, what would come into your head? And then if I was to ask you the second question, what would be most important to you? And I suppose two things that come into my head sometimes is fear and communication. So remember, nothing happens without, as they say, feel the fear and do it anyway. And as a male woman, I keep the hope that one day will Sam McGuire will come home to us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marie, for that 
really fascinating presentation. And I have to say, I can only admire particularly the energy that you bring to the afternoon, particularly for somebody who's just getting over the old COVID because everybody I speak to says lack of energy is what's that they bring out of it. I'm not seeing that with you. And maybe that's no. some of that Mayo magic in there. Well, do you know what, Breen? Also, I'm so proud of our service. I think we've done so well. Yeah, and it's like it's fascinating. I mean, there was one thing that jumped out for me when you were talking there, and yeah. it was on your slide with the various sort of factors and parameters, was that phrase savagely complex. And there's no doubt, I think, without knowing much about the health services, uh, I think we can all instinctively get a grasp for the savagely complex. And you talked about 300 services. And what struck me there was you talked a lot about building trust and clearly the sort of clinician patient trust and that type of thing. I think we can all get our heads around. But with 300 services, I take it that there are major internal trust challenges or there may have been on the journey. Um, yes. What's your experience of, or how do you go about building trust in that sort and of I complexity, suppose... savage complexity, <laughs> if I may. Yeah, and I suppose there's not one simple answer to it, but we take kind of simple rules. We we have three simple rules, and one of the simple rules is build relationships. Building relationships is really important in the services, and particularly for our senior leaders and our local leaders, because everything is local, all change is local. So it comes down. So while the organization might make big, huge policy decision, it has to be implemented locally. So it's how we interpret that ourselves locally. So it's build relationships build capacity, build, enable the people to do the change, enable the people to be connected and create that collective leadership. And then the third thing is being focused on what is it, what we're here about. And if you were to ask any healthcare worker, whether they be a general operative in a hospital or whether they be the porter wheeling you down to theatre or the consultant or the receptionist at the front desk, they will all say, I'm here to help you, the member of the public, navigate the service. And that's what keeps us focused because we're all members of the public as well. And we all have families that have to use the service. And just one antidote, I'd say, Breen, and then I'll stop talking, is one of the very first things uh, we were taught is uh, when nurses are taught is think about that the person that you are doing, that could be you in 20 years time, or it could be a member of your family. Now we're not getting emotionally involved, but it's that you would treat with kindness. And that's what, this, that's what the public wants from us. They want us to treat them with kindness and respect. And that's what we all want, because no matter how complicated things get, if we keep communication open and we have common courtesy and respect, you know, we can move mountains. That is a fantastic note to end that on, Marie. And indeed, I think yeah. th there is no doubt, as you say, with that respect for our customer base, which I think, again, is at the heart of what we come together to talk about as a network and to turn that into practical realities. Um, that is fabulous. I was just checking the Q&A uh, dialogue box. The only question or the only submission we have from the audience so far was to say up Mayo. Um, <laughs> oh, so, yes. Yes, of course. I'm, you're, you're obviously not Kerry alone Kerry this afternoon. <laughs> uh, it's okay they've got away with way too much over the years <laughs> marie listen thanks so much for that we'll come Not back to you point. again with the q a later on in the afternoon and again just to remind everybody that we have that that q a box on webex so if you have either comments submissions thoughts um please feel free to to use that and, and put them in and, and we'll pick them up as we go along so follow that as the fellow says um certainly i think it's, we have a uh, we're moving to another county beginning with an M, I think. We're moving from Mayo to Monaghan next. Um, and we're going to hear from Catherine McGuigan. Catherine is the, the Chief Officer with Age Friendly Ireland. Um, and she's going to talk about the in-depth experiences that Age Friendly Ireland have built engaging with and understanding the needs of older people. And again, as I said, becoming an older person is something I think we all aspire to. And again, in that following that practical vein, Catherine's going to tell us about the toolkits and best practice guides that they've developed to make stakeholder engagement more effective. And she's going to give us some insights into how they've actually translated what's coming through those toolkits into 
improved and more accessible services for the older in our community. So again, Catherine, you're very welcome. I'll give the floor to you. Thank you. Brian, thank you very much. Um, can I ask, can everybody see the screen okay? Is that coming through all right? It is. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's clearly uh, visible. Thanks. Uh, a native of Clonus in County Monaghan, but Meath is actually home to the shared service. So another county beginning with them, um, but uh, I, I can tell you which one is the best one, and that's Monaghan for sure. So um, <laughs> uh, we will be uh, meeting Marie down the line, please God. So look, Brian, I know I'm conscious of time. We have 10 minutes to get through and it's, it's hard for me to get everything into a set of slides, particularly the work that has taken place over the last uh, 12 years. So I'm going to share the slides uh, with, uh, through Nora at the end. But basically, it's just to give you a little bit of context of what the Age Friendly Ireland programme is. It's a shared service, um, one of the 39 shared services hosted by the local government sector under the 2014 reform plan. And basically, it's a World Health Organisation programme that has been rolling out since as early as 2008. Um, in 2008, 2006, 2007, the World Health Organization uh, brought it to the attention of the world that not only have we got massive population growth, um, and but we have population aging and longevity in as much as that people are living a lot longer. And really what they want to do is provide some warning signs about what that is going to present to us and countries in the context of huge policy issues like housing, health, and all of those other things. Um, the mantra is, I, I suppose, that um, this Glenn Miller, uh, 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 I suppose, quotation, the Age Friendly Ireland does not focus just on older people. It's not just, you know, little projects for older people. It's about looking at the life course and all of us begin to age from the minute that we're born. And unfortunately, there's a negative stereo stereotype about aging. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. And it's really, really important in the context of thinking about, yes, there are specific needs for older people, as we know that our needs can become more complex as we age, but that Age Friendly Ireland, when looking at planning and you know buildings and infrastructure and housing and roads and services, um, we actually, I suppose, take a life course um, approach. And we think of when we design for older people, younger people, we exclude other segments of society. But if we design for older people, we include everybody. And older people are not an homogenous group. And uh, interestingly, some years ago, you know, data used to be once you were 65 and older, you were bunched into the one. And I can tell you there's huge variances between the needs of uh, older people and very, very diverse complexities that reach us all. You could have a uh, affluence or social deprivation, rural versus urban mobility versus, you know, immobility, uh, different sort of minority ethnic groups, active people, isolated people, all of those different things. And we try to include those in everything what we do. Now, so just a little bit about the shared service. As I was saying to you earlier, Brian, we're hosted in Meath County Council on behalf of the local government sector. However, core to our, uh, I suppose, function is, is that we're collaborators with a huge number of public services, state agencies, government departments, and so forth. In the shared service, we have 28 staff at the moment. And uh, we have that's underpinned by 31 age friendly programs across all the local authorities, which includes an age friendly program manager in each local authority and an age friendly technical advisor who would look at housing planning, uh, architecture and all of those kind of supports. We have a very strategic alliance at local level, which is chaired by the chief executive in each local authority. And we have interdepartmental teams within the context of the local authority to look at all the diverse range of, I suppose, services that are delivered in local authorities. And I suppose key to that is the Older People's Council. So what we do differently is we listen directly to the citizen. And it's very important in the context of what we're discussing today is that what we do has been everything that we have done. We've rolled out 12,000 initiatives over the last 12 years and scaled up many of them to mainstream. And we have consulted with over 30,000 older people or a diverse range of people to help us inform a number of things. What initiatives should be delivered? What's uh, looking, regulating, I suppose, the impact of them and sort of seeing which ones need to make and um, need to be mainstreamed, which are value for money, which have the most impact. And I suppose, most importantly, influence in policy. And it, I suppose in terms of that, the policy context for Age Friendly Ireland is we're in the programme for government as an objective vision of an Age Friendly Ireland. But we straddle all these government policies here. Uh, housing for all. Uh, we help deliver the housing options for aging population and, and support the delivery of it and the development of it. 
Town Centre First, which looks at, I suppose, vacancy, dereliction and bringing older people back into the town centres. The Climate Action Plan, as Maura said, uh, uh, Slauncha Care, we're very, very uh, working very closely with them on a number of additional initiatives. Uh, the URDF funds, I suppose what we're trying to do is build the age friendliness into everything that is delivered. So in terms of practical implementation, when I was talking to Nora about this particular network, what we ask practitioners to do and people who work in the public service or the civil service is to embed age friendly principles in everything that they do. And by doing that, that means that funding is it's not new money to do things. It's funding is delivered in an age friendly way. So, so far, we have about 55 age friendly towns across the country. Uh, two and a half thousand age friendly business recognition programs. We had our first age friendly hospital in St. Luke's in Kilkenny, and we're scaling that to seven, hopefully um, this year. We have 150 age friendly libraries. We have a plethora of age friendly housing uh, projects across the country and developments. Um, and all of those have been underpinned by a four stage process to inform where they should be, what they should be, what the universal design principles are and so forth. We have an age-friendly primary care centre, two of them in Bolton, Glass and Athai, and we're hoping to scale those up. Uh, we have over 250 age-friendly uh, parking spaces across the country. We have age-friendly seating, age-friendly public realm, age-friendly uh, recreation areas. We're about to launch Croke Park as the first age-friendly stadium in the world next uh, week. Um, we're also doing um, the first two age-friendly airports in the country. Um, we're doing an age-friendly tourist destination and so forth. And our vision is that everywhere in Ireland uh, we go will be recognised as age friendly following a process to make sure that it has been tested by older people for accessibility and, and I suppose that older people can enjoy it. They're just the ones that I've mentioned. We're also doing the age friendly train station and that's really important because when funding, capital funding comes from the NTA and the Department of Transport, that means that whatever modifications they put in, they're delivered in age friendly ways. So that could be signage, access to toilets, getting to the train station, booking online, ticketing information and um, interconnectivity to other places. All of those things are brought into consideration through the four stage process that we do. We also have a housing and public realm training programme, which is a, a CPD approved by the Royal Institute of Architects and the uh, Institute of Planners. And it's embedded in housing for all. And basically what it does, it's about a three hour um, training program that we deliver to architects, planners, engineers, so that every project they do, whether it's capital or current, has age friendliness embedded in it. And the modules contain the principles of universal design, I suppose, what is important to older people and an aging population. And the key to that is what older people have told us is important, is relevant for everybody. So it's a really, really useful. It also brings in SIPTED, which is crime prevention through environmental design. So if any of the participants today are considering, you know, how do I bring in safety and security into any elements of work that I do, that's really important element of it as well. And we deliver this through local authorities, to AHBs, to the construction sector, to civil society, um, uh, to the departmental staff. It's a module there that is, uh, as I say, accredited and free for delivery to everybody in the public service and civil service. On our website, uh, Brion, we have a number of um, publications, toolkits and guidebooks. And as I say, the four stage process that the WHO have recognised um, we go through that, which is, you know, consultation with older people, doing a walkability audit, sitting down and aggregating the information that comes back and looking at what can be achieved. We ask older people to co-design the solutions and co-deliver in some cases as well. We present those to the powers that be and then we implement the actual plan. So that's the four stage process. So our website contains all that suite of resources. There's 10 ways to an age friendly home, age friendly planning guidelines for county development plans pre-planning guidance for residential care homes and um, booklets for seating and um, we've done research on right sizing and supporting older people to, to remain in the community in their own community so there's a, a plethora of those on our website and um, during the pandemic for example you know we went to communication regulator because a lot of our older people's councils were coming into us and saying they were having difficulty with you know, access and services, getting somebody to come out and fix a faulty phone line in the pandemic, how reliant they were on their little panic buttons and couldn't get, they were having connectivity issues. So Comreg brought us in to meet all the CEOs of the communication programs uh, or, or, or companies, and we relayed those, um, I suppose, uh, issues back to them. So Air and Vodafone and 
Virgin and Tree and all of them came and Air in particular, I'm highlighting this was an example, came and actually met with our National Network of Older People's Councils and put in a plan of delivery. And what they really heard was, right, actually speaking to somebody and a real person instead of hanging on a phone for 40 minutes and pressing buttons. So they set up the Age Friendly Helpline, which is a dedicated helpline within Air for people over 65 years of age. And you ring through and actually they asked one of our older people's council who worked for P&T for 40 years to be the voice. So when you pick up the phone, he says, hi, you're through to air. Just tell us if you're a broadband customer or a mobile customer. And you press one or two and you immediately get through to a person in air. So this is an example of how consultation can be responsive, whether you're in the private sector or whatever, and how you can do that. So they've actually done that and dedicated that line and that service because they heard what older people said. And oftentimes it's a case of, well, we can complain about services or we we'll say they're not great. But if you go in and try to co-design the solution and it's coming from the citizen, it works very well. And that's what stood to us. So that's the dedicated line. And it was launched in Dublin. It was lovely. Similarly, we've done that with Ulster Bank because of their closures. We've done it with the finance sector, done it with Impost. We do it with the advertising agency about media portrayal of older people. We do it with Caro's through the climate action plans and on and on. That continuous, I suppose, consultation and co-design with older people is critical. Older people tell us that just because you know what you're talking about doesn't mean I do. So acronyms and jargon and all that sort of stuff, older people don't like that. And I'm not sure anybody really does. So it's really important that the language you use is the vernacular. Do you know what I mean? And that it's, it's also not discourteous. Like older people say, don't speak to me like I'm stupid, but don't necessarily tell me that I know what you're talking about just because you've been working in that job for 20 years. So it's really, really important that you get the balance right in terms of clear uh, uh, things that were explained to people. So we would incorporate this as part of our age friendly business training. And for example, when the community call helplines were set up, a lot of people were being asked to come in from different sectors and you know answer the phones and speak to older people. And they might not necessarily have been on calls before. So we gave them training, a full suite of age friendly communication training, looking at somebody's sensory impairment might have hearing difficulties, they might have dexterity issues, they mightn't be in a good place, they might have basic literacy issues. A lot of the population of older people who come from maybe early school leavers in the farming community, 13 and 14, might have basic literacy issues and often to navigate through life, not being able to get over that. So, you know, we're cognizant of all that and we, we teach that and we, we've delivered it to all of these people, national service providers, library staff, community call staff. It's available. That comms training is available for any public service and we will deliver it to people. We will take the module loan. With, I suppose, the remote working, those can be delivered a lot more, I suppose, frequently and easily instead of having to do a face-to-face -face workshop. One message today, and I think I'm running out of time, Brian. Older people ask us, we've taken a retrograde step in the, in the pandemic. Don't panic. Okay. They don't like the word elderly. Okay. And the WHO have just released, I suppose, a big campaign. We're not campaigners, obviously, because we're in the public service. We bring older people to come in and collaborate. They don't need to lobby. We bring them in and we'll, they'll speak to departments and they'll speak to service providers. An elderly is a ne negative uh, connotation. And um, in some sort of uh, European countries, they think the word elder is, is seen as an actual, you know, I suppose more a distinguished title. It's older people globally and universally is the title that we should use for people when we're talking about aging. And in the pandemic, we got a lot of poor media portrayal about the elderly. And I haven't met a 65 year old that likes to be called elderly, particularly those that are still working and maybe running a household and doing X, Y and Z and are busier than the rest of us. So it's really important that we get the language right and that we portray um, anybody, you know, and, and in any segment of society in a way that they feel. And, and in that we've met with all the communications, the media, we've met with the advertising agency and a lot of the agencies are actually um, their employees are very young <clears throat> and might necessarily by what we call as unconscious bias. You know, you might be unconsciously biased towards using negative uh, stereotypes and not realize it. And that's just a little bit. There's the depiction of it, Brion, <clears throat> is decline in frailty is associated with elderly. And the older people that I work with, I'm certainly irrespective of what their le levels of ability are, still don't, still don't like that connotation. These are some direct quotes that older people have told us. The word elderly sounds, sounds bent over, wrinkled. The word older is strong, upright. Frail is a dreadful word. Sounds frail of mind as well as body. We may have slowed up a little, but our knowledge and experience is still there. So maybe just because I can't move as quick, 
it doesn't mean that any other part of me has you know depreciated we don't want to be dusted down and put in the corner people over the age of 60 going right up to whatever age are not an homogenous group there are huge differences in wants and needs of the person in that 30 year or so span and the word vulnerable is triggering and it's funny to hear the word triggering because i hear my 17 year old using the word i'm triggered but one of our older people said it's triggering so it's a nice young term apparently the word vulnerable is triggering look at the last four letters able we are not as fast in certain things as we used to be we are we're still well able in so many areas so brian again uh, conscious of time we have done loads of programs like digital peer-to-peer -peer training programs we get older people to train older people and we get staff in libraries and different bcps and that to train older people we had a new way of meeting in the pandemic we had this, I suppose, narrative that older people couldn't meet online. We had a huge amount of participation of older people. And a lot of that consultation with the likes of Vodafone and Comreg and all that was all taking place online. We have a weekly newsletter, which we delivered daily in the pandemic. And that goes out to 3000 stakeholders. Everybody's welcome to register for that. And also you can follow us on Twitter and go on Facebook. We have videos on YouTube and so forth. We use every communication channels that we can, as well as the old letter in the post, because some people still like that too. And there's just our two websites, Brian. H Friendly Ireland tells us all about the program, all those resources. And we have a collaborative program with the Department of Health, Housing and the Housing Agency around specific age friendly development. So all information on funding, planning, guidelines, regulations, legislation for building age friendly developments and older people right sizing their own homes is available on that website. So there you go, Brian, 22 slides. <laughs> I hope Very that's uh, to you, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you so much. And yeah, yeah, I have to say 22 slides in, in 10 minutes is quite an achievement. Um, I was really struck by that whole piece about the language, and I think it's probably so important in all aspects of, of delivery, but it's particularly that, that use of the, the word elder being pejorative. I mean, I suppose all that it brings to my mind is those extraordinarily young people who come to the door with the words Elder Jones or whatever on their name tag trying to sell a certain religion. Um, so obviously in some communities, Elder is a term of respect. I, mean, I was really struck as well when you talked about that whole life course concept um, and what it brought to my mind was that a, a phrase that I think John Hume used to love using about, about othering, uh, you know, the idea that it's not about taking the I'm not going to say elderly, the older members of our community and sort of packaging them away and that we must deliver certain things for them, um, but rather that they are part of mm -hmm. part of the citizenry and that we all have needs at different stage in our life okay. course. And I think that that was really striking in what you said. One question that that struck me was, um, you know, you talked about giving people the opportunity to to test drive and literally test drive. That was an interesting phrase when you were talking about things like parking spaces and so on and so forth. Um, the type of facilities you're recommending uh, or, or promoting the delivery of. But equally, you also talked about the engagement of the professionals, the engineers, the architects and that. And I was sort of curious to know whether you get conflicts between the lived experience of the community you're trying to support and the professionals who know what's best for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the biggest challenges, so we have 55 age friendly towns and part of that is a walkability audit. And the tool that we have, we did in partnership with the Center of Excellence in Universal Design. We were the only country in the world that has a dedicated Center of Excellence in Universal Design and they're critical partners for us. And obviously there, there's UD and there's UD plus and UD plus plus. And, you know, there's this kind of fallacy that it's all money related. Of course, the better you go, the better, the de better design material, it's going to cost more. But you balance that with, well, what if I don't do it? You know what I mean? And then, you know, you, you have all these dividends, opportunities missed that you're not getting. Um, so when we do a walkability audit, Brian, using this audit, bit, audit, audit tool, we would bring in um, older people. We would bring in older people with disabilities, carers for people with dementia, minorities group. But we also bring in um, uh, parents with toddlers and double buggies. And we also bring in TY students and different. Uh, and we also bring in very active people. And then even more recently, we're widening that now with cyclists and things like that, because it's a very complex agenda. So we bring in counsellors as well. And we bring in planners who are logical people and probably a lot of them on here today 
and you know you look at rules and you look at regulations and suddenly you've been asked well could you think beyond the the, the scope of that and could we do something creative and the volume of innovation that has come in by those people because of the buy-in process because of listening and the older people saying well I, I, this is my only street up to the main street and I'm in a wheelchair. And because of that dip that you have to put in to let drain water, I can't go over that in my wheelchair, which means I can't get out of my house every day unless somebody comes down. And then the engineer will say, well, do you know what I can do? I can meet the guidelines, but I can create a slope. That means that you can still go over it and you can still go up the town. And that's called balance and that's called taking all those in. And not everybody, we don't give people a wish list, we get people to come together. But when you give people ownership of design and what is potentially can be implemented, that's where you see the beauty of the innovation and everybody saying, we've all got, we've we, to use the analogy, every, there's a place on the pitch for everybody, Brian, you know? And just as opposed to, that, and that's what we do with every piece of initiative that we put in. And just on the great, late great Hume's othering, you know, older people say is, they were referred to as those people, do you know what I mean? And it'd be the same if you're talking for the teenagers, the teenagers or the youngsters. Nobody likes being categorised. So people just have to rethink the traditional values that we've had of categorising people. And actually, the WHO report on ageism said it's not just older people that suffer ageism. It's young people as well, people in younger generations and being stereotyped. So we need to reevaluate the way in which we put people in boxes and just start every to see everybody as just people. And that's just the way it is. And Thank again, you, Brian. Thanks. Thanks very much, Catherine. And again, I can see from the chat box, we will certainly be coming back to you later on in the Q&A. Um, but, but again, just interesting to see the theme coming through things. Um, just, just your last few remarks there brought me very much back to Marie, um, that idea of engaging with respect, um, whether it be um, the more mature in our society or the younger, or those with healthcare issues, um, the same messages coming across, and clearly, or even public servants, dare I say it, because we often get categorised too as a single homogenous group, and and the differences are so vast between us, and so many different needs and lived experiences. So, listen, Absolutely. thanks again, Catherine, and we'd certainly be coming back to you, and I really appreciate the the passion that you bring to the topic as well. It's fantastic. So we're going to move on now to another area that's that's truly universal, uh, and, and that's the, the one that we all have to deal with within the next week, I think it is. Um, so let's get real here, folks. Um, the piece of paper that's sitting at everybody's houses um, waiting to be filled in. But as I say, for most of us, that doesn't bring challenges. For some in our society, it clearly does. So uh, our next speaker, Cormac Halpin. And Cormac, you're very welcome. Cormac is a senior statistician with the sense of management in the CSO. And he's going to talk to us about how the CSO are engaging with citizens just to deal with those accessibility challenges and to ensure that that's fully integrated into the census process. And again, just to remind everybody as Cormac's talking that you will have that the, the chat box is there. There are a few questions building up. We'll come back to all of the speakers in the open Q&A at the end. So please feel free to use that. Um, but immediately now we'll hear from Cormac and this really interesting topic. So Cormac, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, and thanks to the network for the opportunity to come and have a chat with you today. Um, we're in evangelical mode at the moment on the census project. Our big day is coming up or the country's big day is coming up as we'd like to think on Sunday. So you'll be seeing lots of us this week in, in lots of different fora and media spreading the good word of the census. So thanks again for the opportunity. So um, again, like the previous speakers, I'm going to try and condense quite a bit into 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about Census 2022 just at a very high level to give a bit of context. Um, having been speaking with Grace last week, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the content on the forum gets decided. And then I'm going to go into the, the main part of the, the, the presentation, which is the accessibility in the field operation. Now, I'm conscious of, of jargon. The field operation is the bit where we interface with the public. So effectively, when we, we deliver the forms and collect them. And then finally, I'm going to talk about where the folks will turn next year in 2023, which is publishing census data and some of the accessibility aspects of retrieving census data and accessing census data on our website, CSO.ie. Oh, apologies, I've gone too far there. Okay, um, I'm going to become a, a hat trick of presenters now to talk about COVID. Uh, the census was due to take place last year in 2021, but unfortunately, we had to postpone the census. Um, this was a decision taken towards the end of 2020. 
um, I think primarily for obvious reasons in that we couldn't guarantee the health of our field staff or the public in conducting um, what is a traditional census, which basically involves people calling door to door to every dwelling in the country. Um, people may not be aware, but there are lots of different ways of doing a census that varies around the world. We in Ireland have a traditional census, which is the hand deliver and hand collect of paper forms, which brings accessibility advantages, but also disadvantages, which, which I'll touch on. As I said, we have a 10 week field operation. We're coming towards the end of the first phase of that at the moment. So for the last four and a half weeks, the new mayors have been going around the country, making great progress in, in delivering the forms. We're nearly there. Um, there are pockets to be noted. Some of you haven't received your form yet. Um, don't panic. The, the new mayors are on their way. They know, they know where the forms haven't been delivered. And after Sunday, they'll spend the next five weeks going back to collect the census forms, um, at which point they'll be returned to our HQ and SOARS, and the next phase of the operation will start. Just to give you a bit of context on how it works, we've got 5,600 field staff. 5,100 of those are the enumerators, who are the people that knock on the door. The other 500 above those are effectively managers at, at various levels. We're going to be knocking, or have knocked, at nearly 2.2 .2 million doors over the last four and a half weeks. And hopefully, as I said, by Sunday, we'll have knocked on 2.2 .2 million doors, um, which, as you can imagine, is a major logistical challenge. Um, to kind of move on to the next phase then, we will be publishing preliminary results in at the end of June. So these are essentially uh, a kind of a, a provisional population figure that we'll produce down to county level. They won't be the official results, but there is a big demand um, from various organizations and user groups for a, a kind of an early site of the census data. We do caveat these results to say that they will be superseded next year by the official results. And next year will be when all the data from the inside of the forms will be released. It's just population figures will come out in June. And then the official results, as I said, we're hoping um, they will commence from April of next year. And I'll talk a little bit later on about what kind of format they will be released in. In terms of the form content, so we launched a public consultation in 2017. What that involved was um, basically inviting suggestions, submissions from the public, from interested organisations, um, to tell us what kind of questions they would like to see on the census form for 2021 as was, but 2022 as it transpired to be. We received over 400 submissions, which was a record by, by a long chalk, and I think that's probably because Census 2016 was run on a no-change basis from Census 2011, um, which created a huge amount of pent-up demand by statistical users, and that's been realised, I think, in the Census Forum with a significant degree of change. We formed a Census Advisory Group. Um, I'm sure some of your organisations had representatives in that group. Um, there was about 40 individuals on that group, um, and they were representative of users of census data. And they helped the CSO to sift through those 400 plus submissions and make decisions on which questions, new questions, and which revised questions should be tested in a census pilot, which was taking place on, the on September 2018. The pilot was conducted in about 10,000 households, and we, we circulated test census forms with revised questions to see how well they worked. Um, I think I would say that demand exceeded supply in terms of the questions. We're, we're very limited by space. For what we can put in the census questionnaire we'd love to have a 70 or 80 page form but that wouldn't be completed very well and would put a huge statistical burden on people as well as that a large number of the questions on the census form are required under eu regulations so we've got no no choice they have to be there so there's quite a lot of horse trading goes on with various organizations and within the census advisory group um, for questions to appear in the form after the pilot was conducted, we reconvened the Census Advisory Group to look at the results of the pilot, and ultimately the upshot of that was that we, um, the CSO and the Census Advisory Group, put a recommendation to government, and the government approved the census form in July 2019. And just to summarise, there are eight new questions on the census form and revisions to 25 existing questions, which might look like just a statistic there in the screen, but it's a huge um, amount of change, bearing in mind what's happened in the past in the census. So there's a lot of new questions and a lot of new data is going to come out of the census this time round. Going back to the field operation, um, as I said, we've got uh, quite a large cohort of field staff. We actually have four levels. So we've got the 5,100 enumerators, about 400 field supervisors. Um, the, field, the enumerators will report into them. So between 10 to 15 enumerators will report to a field supervisor. The field supervisors then report to regional supervisors who are responsible for areas roughly proximate to a county, depending on population density. And then those regional supervisors report into six census liaison officers who have the country divided up into six between them. So that's a, a very big responsibility. The way we, we train our field staff, it's a kind of a cascade approach. So we will train in CSO the regional supervisors and the census liaison officers directly. They then cascade their training down to the field supervisors and the enumerators. And that's what happened in the months leading up to, to February when we started delivering the forms. There is a strong emphasis on accessibility um, as part of the training. And we do have involvement of external groups, including the NCBI and the NDA, um, to help us make sure that we've got as much support as possible. 
what I would say at the outset is because we do run a traditional census, um, we have an enumerator calling um, to every dwelling in the country, and that gives great advantages. You know, it gives the personal touch to people. It gives them a, a line um, back into Census HQ or up the chain um, of command within the field operation if needs be. It's actually quite rare in developed countries um, that the, the census is undertaken this way. As I mentioned, there are lots of different ways the census can be undertaken. I think we're almost unique among developed countries where the enumerator knocks on every single door. So that does give us that that personal touch and we have found um hopefully in this census but certainly in previous censuses is that an enumerator making contact to the door is the best way to guarantee that a form gets collected afterwards um the enumerator as i said is also trained in all the various accessibility aids that we have and to provide help um that, that people may have with individual questions or the census process so we train them quite intensively before they start the field operation and um, so they're quite well equipped to deal with queries that may arise in the field uh, at the outset, I'd say that um, our website, census.ie, it's a separate website to the corporate CSO website, it provides a huge amount of information about the accessibility and help for people to fill out their forms. So I'll just go through some of the key supports that we do provide. So for people who may have a visual impairment, um, we provide, uh, well, the enumerators will have access to a large print form, which is more readable. So every enumerator will be equipped with a large print form and um, that can be requested on demand um, from, from people as they, they go door to door. We also have that large print form available for download on our website. We also have audio versions of the form. So every question in the form is there in audio version that can be digitally downloaded. It's also available on compact disc um, on order. Again, enumerators are aware of this. Um, we also have Braille forms that we've developed in conjunction with the NCBI. So again, they are available on demand, both either directly through the CSO, through our various channels where people can contact us, which I'll, I'll touch on later on, or directly through the enumerator. So there's, there's quite a lot of support that we've agreed with the NCBI has made available there. For people with hearing impairments, we have videos on our website on census.ie. Um, where the form is, is again described, each question is described with subtitles and translated into Irish Sign Language as well. We also have a translation service available on demand um, through Irish Sign Language that also is available on our website and through the enumerators. Uh, we have quite a, a wide range of language support available. So what we do here, and, and forgive me for verging into the statistical, but that's, that's, that's my area. We analyze the, the results from the previous census to see the most commonly spoken um, languages outside of Irish and English by the population in the last census. And they are the areas, the languages that we focus on for providing support in the next census. So we have the census form translated into 22 different languages. And one of them is Ukrainian to preempt some questions that might appear in the chat box later on. And we're, we're very happy that it, that is the case um, with the, the large amount of refugees incoming um, at, at the moment. Um, one thing that I would say, and this is a drawback with the type of census that we are running, with all of the, the various supports that we have available, um, the visually impaired, the hearing impaired, and the language support, they are just that support. Um, we do require the census forms to be to be completed, and we're fully aware that those, that does provide challenges. Um, unfortunately, that is one of the drawbacks of a paper census, and I will talk um, just briefly at the end about this, the future of census and where we're going in that regard. And finally, here, we do have literacy, literacy support as well. So we provide a plain English guide to completing the census form that we developed with NALA, the National Adult Liter Literacy Agency, which is available again for download on our website. That's um, a, a very useful guide um, to cut through some of the jargon. And, and we, we try to de-jargon as best we can uh, what's on the census form. But unfortunately, for various reasons, GDPR and so on, there is a bit of language on there that's, that's not very user friendly. So we try to cut through that to the greatest extent possible in that guide. So finally, as I said, census.ie is the repository for all this information on accessibility. Um, the website itself has been designed with accessibility in mind as well. So hopefully it's, it's um, of use to people to, to access that information. Moving on then to census data. So this is the focus for next year for us in 2023. Um, we produce a very large range of data products and I've just lifted them out very briefly here, um, kind of in, in um, descending order of um, data analytical um, confidence, I guess. So the main most visible releases that we produce are thematic releases. So these are the, we, you know, we focus on areas such as commuting, um, such as jobs and work, such as disability and health, um, ethnicity and migration. And we produce dedicated releases on each of those. The focus in these releases are very much on visualizations. So, you know, there's not big reams of numbers or tables. Um, you know, there is a lot of focus on maps and charts that makes the data more easily accessible. The main audience that we have in mind for, for, these, for these releases are the more casual data users, um, people that might be interested in census, community groups that mightn't be that interested in downloading the detailed numbers and working on them that way, and also the media who tend to pick up a lot of the visualizations that we use um, and integrate them into their releases. 
Um, for the next step up, then we have a database that's called PX Staff, which I'll talk a little bit about in the next the next slide. But that's the main dissemination tool that we have both in census and across CSO. There's a huge amount of data there. Um, some of it is pre-baked, but it does allow a bit of flexibility for people to, to generate their own data for their own county, for their own area, and um, to find out census data there too. We have a small area mapping tool and the data draws from a PXSAT database there. So this is something that, that a lot of people are, are not aware of. Census data is produced down to a very, very low layer area of, of geography. So by geography, I mean area. So we produce census data for areas of 250 dwellings. So that might be your local housing estate, um, your apartment block or, or, or wherever you might live. Um, there are 18,000 small areas across Ireland and there's a vast amount of information about those small areas. Um, it's important to stress that confidentiality is as important to us as accessibility. Um, so we, we designed the, the output of our data to make sure that individuals aren't identifiable in it, and that's very important to us as well. But having said that, there's a huge amount of local data that's a very, very important for lots of planners and community groups and the various users of census data. And finally, I, I won't go into great detail on this, but um, particularly for research organizations and academic users, um, we produce micro data sets, which are anonymized um, census data files that the likes of research organizations such as the SRI, Trinity College, UCC, for example, would use quite extensively um, to, to develop their own tables that aren't reliant on CSO to produce theirs. So we'll be producing lots in that area over the next couple of years. Moving on then uh, very briefly to the CSO website, you know, I, I think I think it's, it's a theme for CSO over the last number of years that we want to improve the accessibility of CSO data. If you look back um, to CSO websites, I know you can't do it at the moment, but, but I can, and it makes me cringe a little bit where we are now. Um, in previous years and up to including census 2026, the data that was produced was in tables, table after table, and it's absolutely horrendous to look at. A lot of it was produced on uh, on paper publications, just table after table. And you look back, you know, it's only 15, 16 years ago, and you think, well, how do we ever think that that was a good idea? I think the reason was because the focus was very much on expert users of data and not um, for the public. And I think it's very welcome that CSO has a sea change in that regard. And it's one of our key strategic goals to make sure that the data is accessible. So those thematic releases that I mentioned are, are a key way of doing that, of, of bringing census data to people that might not necessarily use data on a day to day basis. More broadly across CSO, um, we were guilty in the past as well of producing our publications and our releases in lots of different format that mightn't be that friendly for, for you know, a universal audience. So PDF documents, Word documents, Excel, we're moving away from that. Um, I think as of 2020, we no longer produce any releases on that, and they're all coming out now on HTML with much more visualizations, as I said. There are still some, some bogeys on the website. There are still some that are there on PDF, on an Excel. Um, they are being worked through, but there's just so many of them. They are still in existence. Um, my colleagues that, that are responsible for the web, website have assured me that if uh, people do want to access a previously produced publication, but it's in a format that's not accessible, they will certainly provide assistance and all the, the contact details are on cso.ie. As I said, we've introduced PXStat, um, apologies for the jargon, the native dissemination tool basically means that everything can sit into it. We're moving away from PDF, Word and Excel formats across the different areas of CSO and all of our releases are coming out of this. PXStat is, is much better than the, the database that we had previously. It's color compliant, it's optimized for screen readers and it's open source data, which basically means that users can use their own um, machine tools to access the data directly. They don't have to go in and download an Excel file or a CSV file, copy the data and paste it into it. Um, and I'm glad to, to announce that the, there'll be a new census mapping tool for the data that comes out of census 2022 on the PXStat platform that will be much more integrated with the CSO website and much more accessible with those principles in mind. This is my final slide. Um, I've, I've kind of highlighted the upside of, of the CSO website. There are some challenges that still remain. We've recently had a compliance audit um, on the EU accessibility directive of the website. We did score relatively high. Um, I'm sure that we were number four at about 50 organizations, but my, again, my colleagues on the website were adamant that they wanted to improve. So we've enlisted the help of the NDA and the NCBI um, to help us improve where we were lacking on that. A big one is, is navigation. We have done a lot in navigation, um, including introducing tools to Zoom um, to bring in text alternatives. Um, but I think just given where we're coming from a legacy perspective, there's just vast oceans of data on our website, some of which, as I said, we're not in user friendly format. We're trying to address those over time. Um, and that is something that's, that's in progress. We are, we are incorporating more visualizations um, to bring the data, to, as I said, to people that, that might be familiar with working with data analytics. And um, that does bring its own challenges. So there is an emphasis on, on universal design 
and, and bringing in things like, um, you know, as I said, text alternatives. We are using more videos as well, um, but we are introducing Irish Sign Language, as I said, with the census video uh, translation on those and also subtitles. So that's a really big focus for us on the website at the moment. It's, it's not fully there yet. It has improved an awful lot in the last three or four years, and it is something that we're very cognizant on. And as the person that's responsible for the outputs for the census next year, it's something that I really welcome. The, the 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 outputs that we produce next year won't have a huge amount of text on them. I think the amount of text has been decreasing uh, census after census from 2011 to 16 to 22, and that'll certainly be the way forward next time as well. So we won't be bombarding people with you know huge sentences that span over five or six lines, which is sometimes what statisticians are guilty of, with, with lots of statistics crammed into them, which is going to be made as digestible and comprehensible as possible. I'm nearly finished, uh, Brian. The last thing I just wanted to, 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 to mention to you is where the future of census is going. So I did mention that you know there are challenges with, with, with the paper form. Um, I, I'm pleased to announce again that the government recently approved in principle that census 2027, which is when the next census will be, will be an online first census. So that'll bring the CSO in line with most of the English speaking countries, how they do the census. So um, the, the, the main way that people will interact with the, the CSO in 2027 is that they will receive um, communication through the post, basically an invitation letter to complete their census form online. So they'll be able to do that on a laptop, on a tablet, on a mobile, whatever other technologies exist in 2027, that will be facilitated. Um, we're, we're a bit away from that, but we're very conscious of accessibility and that'll form a big part of the design of the operation. Um, so that's that's great news, I think. Um, but I'm I'm also conscious that there are issues around accessibility of of you know using the uh, accessing the services online, and there are also issues around broadband um, in certain parts of the country. Hopefully, they will have improved by 2027. But there will be a paper option again in 2027. So we would expect that to be a minority of the country would be completing their census forms on paper. Um, looking at the international experience, um, countries like Canada and Australia, for example, have been leading the charge in this. And typically, they see over 90% of the population would complete their census form online when it's available. So we'd expect that certainly at least to be the case by 2027. And looking forward into the distant future, just briefly to mention that the way that we do the census at the moment, um, which is requiring every household to complete a return, is, is probably in its sunset days as well. I think by 2031, um, CSO will probably be gathering census data from administrative data sources. So again, lots of your organizations, um, CSO would have access to it, um, particularly organizations like DSP, like Revenue, like the Department of Education. CSO has access to a huge amount of information from those organizations that we can use for statistical purposes. So that's the way that most European countries actually conduct their census, and that's the way that CSO is moving. So. Um, you know, it, it does bring challenges, the 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 door-to-door the -door and the, the requirement to answer a questionnaire, but I think those days will, will probably be going out after 2027. That all has to be finalised and it's nine years down the track, but I think that's certainly the, the direction of travel um, for, for CSO and for the, you know, the, the future of the census. So I'll wrap there. I could probably talk about the census for, for another few hours, but um, I'm conscious of the time limits, so I'll, uh, I'll put a pause to it there. That's great. Thank you very much, Cormac. And again, I think you used the term evangelical at the start of that. And again, in, in common with the two previous speakers, you, you really did give us that that sense of a very deep enthusiasm for your topic, which is which is always great. It's, you know, I, I, nobody's going to accuse collectively or individually public servants have not been enthusiastic about what they do for a living. If you, if, if you saw us all this afternoon um, and the one thing that really struck me very powerfully about your presentation was that concept of, of access, not just being about that basic piece of the civic duty to complete the return, but also that other piece about accessibility of the results and the product and that idea that that is for all and not just for, I suppose, data hungry organizations like my own revenue where, you know, and it's, I always find fascinating. Like we like to think we, we know everything about everybody, but really CSO's knowledge is, is so much deeper and richer. Um, but with that comes that massive duty of confidentiality that you talked about. Um, well, I suppose that, that leads me to a really interesting question that as you shift your client base or the citizens generally from, I suppose, the friendly face-to-face -face enumerator into the future to the online one, the trust that underpins the, basically the disclosing of personal information to an anonymous CSO, um, would you have concerns that that breaks down or, you know, because obviously the, the friendly enumerator can give assurances on the doorstep about the confidentiality and you're looking at people's living arrangements, their travel arrangements, their income, very, very private stuff. You know, how, and obviously this has been done elsewhere around the world differently. So how do you see that challenge? Well, I, I think you're right to use the word challenge, Brian. I'm I'm old school in the census. I've I've worked in a number of censuses now. 
Um, and the model that we have is 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 very reliant that way, you know, reliable that way. Um, I think there's a certain degree of assurance that people get from a new meter calling door to door. Um, you know, the new meter is very well versed in in the, the various guarantees that we have on confidentiality in the in the census. And you know, I certainly think that will be a loss um, when we move to 2027. You know, we, we have explored the possibility of our new meter dropping in the form individually. Um, but unfortunately, that horrendous word budget um, intervenes when we, we try to do that. It, it will be very difficult to justify maintaining the size of the field force that we have, you know, when there will be a significant amount of expenditure required to go online. I would say that, you know, um, one of the things that we really re re lobbied the government for um, was that we could move to 2027 to, to, to produce the census. If we were to go back to the five year cycle and skip COVID, the next census would be due in 2026. But, you know, we feel very strongly that we do need the extra year to test, test, test. That's a real mantra within within our area in census. You know, we're going to be developing major systems and there's going to be a huge focus on confidentiality um, and the protection of people's data. And we're, we're very conscious as well that there have been major incidents, thankfully not in Ireland so far, uh, but in other countries, particularly Australia and New Zealand in both 2016 and 2018, where there were major census fails, as the hashtag said at the time, particularly in Australia, where there was an attack on their internet site. It was very unfortunate for them and, you know, we worked very closely with our international colleagues and other organisations. It was a very, very difficult time for them, as you can imagine, and became a major issue for the government. But I think from a census perspective, there's once bitten, twice shy. So we have emphasised again and again when it comes to funding and the requirement for time for this, um, that we do require a, a significant amount of time. I, I just to go back to another point that I mentioned as well that that if there are you know issues of trust or people just don't don't trust the internet for returning their census, a paper option will be there. Um, we will have a reduced field force, as I said. That's that's you know unfortunately one of the, the the side products of going online. But if people want to complete a census form on paper, it absolutely will be there as an option for them, um, and they can return it to the numerator as as was the case. The international experience, as I said, is that most people um, will re return their form online. But if people have any issues with it whatsoever, that will absolutely be an option for them next time round. Great, thanks very much, Cormac. Yeah, it's uh, as, as you say, challenging but really interesting, and you know it it, it sort of brings you back into that overarching theme of of the digital citizen engagement and how we manage those issues like trust and accessibility um sort of as we move forward into that kind of i hate you using cliches like brave new world but but very much there interestingly enough i mean i know your own office has just recently published the results of their trust survey and it's certainly something that i think is going to be a theme of this network into the future this year because it's a very fundamental part of sort of building that engagement but one of the interesting statistics i think coming out of the recent survey is that 65 percent of irish people believe that their data will be used for legitimate purposes when they disclose it to the public sector so um that's a very good figure it's a very cheering figure it's very positive um and it sort of reflects on other things like the whole data protection environment that we have around us too so but a hugely important part of just building and maintaining the as I say, trust is a theme for a later event at this network, but interesting all three speakers in one way or another have brought us into the area of trust this afternoon. So um, that's that's really important. And certainly yours is a particularly trusted organization because people do bear their souls to a certain extent, I think, in, in, in the census. Just to, to maybe move the conversation along and we have about less than 20 minutes left and like it's been a really interesting afternoon so far but um i know we've a few questions coming in on the chat box and we'll pick those up in one second what i wanted to do maybe just briefly is to put one question to to all of the speakers and that's around the whole idea of the cost of accessibility because obviously accessibility does cost um and you know you you can deliver the simple streamlined service to the majority and it costs an awful lot less so, and the marginal cost of guaranteeing accessibility is quite significant and that's a challenge in our organizations and maybe i might just turn to yourself marie to begin with on that because uh, obviously within the hse with your 300 services is that a debate in the organization or how do you make the case to secure the budget for accessibility and I suppose that's where I suppose the whole move in, in the health service at the moment is to launch a care to make it accessible at the point of delivery so that we have enhanced community care networks. So it's about, I suppose, um, harnessing the resource that we have so that it's more accessible to the pe people who really need it. And so our primary care teams, you know, are, are there. So if I need an OT or if I need a physio, 
do you know what I mean, that I get that access through my primary care so that that primary care team is really engaged. And then our integrated care pathways, then if, if, if that physio then needs to link in maybe with a specialist service in the hospital, that that pathway is there and is accessible to people. So for us, it's you know, it's like the silo way of working and, you know, and as public services, we're all there to serve the public. But in the HSC, with all these different services, it's more about us, you know, the communication piece again. <laughs> and that integration piece. And there's no point having 10 professionals going into a house when it, the professional who's really needed is not going into the house. Do you know what I mean? So it that's where I think the whole focus of what's in the service at the moment around the, our enhanced community care networks, about our integrated care pathways, and that the, we're enabling our staff to work in teams. Do you know what I mean? That that will bring it much more to life. Do you know? So I do indeed. Uh, thanks, Marie. Yeah, and very much around that that trust, that communication, that relationship management across the professionals within the services. Yes. yes. I'd like to turn to Catherine on, on the same issue, and it's slightly different in your case because obviously you're sponsoring a lot of this, but the various bodies that you engage with, what you need to do is convince them to pony up an element of their budget to deliver the accessibility initiatives you're promoting. Um, again, just I'm just interested in the in the challenge around that because this is where the rubber hits the road when we come to prioritize stuff. You're absolutely right, and it is the rubber hitting the road because it's, for 12 years I'm I'm still and I'm and at this stage I'm getting more of the traction now. So the way I see it is we can't afford not to be accessible. It's more of a cost not to be accessible, and I can give you very practical examples of that. And I'm going back 12, 13 years ago, Brian, and we're saying, oh my God, it's 40 percent extra to add in universal design into age friendly housing and. And it's simply not. That's the first thing. And, and, and you can look at second fixed joinery and different things like that where you offset costs. And that's the work that the NDA and the CUD are doing. But for example, a very practical example, uh, the rough budget between the department and the 20 percent from local authorities is 100 million a year to do retrofits in houses to make them accessible. OK, so that's people living in homes that are falling, going into hospital. 10.5 days is the average in hospital, which is 1100 euro a night before you get an x ray. Okay, because a fall you might have fallen over a door saddle, or you might have been trying to get up the stairs when you're not fit to another way. So, you get this grant of 32 and a half grand to come and put in an accessible toilet or an accessible downstairs wet room. And if you forward plan and put the wet room in when you were building the house, the costs are you know marginal. Okay, so there's an, a very practical mm. example. And we will get someday to where the houses are built with them by default. And then and it's, you're not going to prevent the fall, but you'll certainly prevent the risk of falling and the amount of that. Another example is people transitioning into residential care prematurely. So that could be a child or an adult with learning difficulties or an older person. That's currently a cost to the state for a planning norm of about 4.5% of people over 65. It's roughly about 1.2 billion a year Okay, for residential care. And those coordinated co costs that uh, Maria is talking about in this launch care vision of people being looked after in the community and the primary and the network of, of services. We're actually doing the Healthy Age Friendly Homes program, which is coordinating the health and housing services to keep people at home. But basically the cost of not providing accessibility and that doesn't matter if it's somebody going in to get a form or being able to do their census form or being able to get access at the right time. There's a cost if they're not given that there's an ongoing cost and people need to say, I need to just restructure my budget to make sure this is accessible as possible so that I don't have more costs. And the word silo Marie used, we're also in Ireland, a reactionary country. We're, we're, we're changing and sometimes reaction is good. Like we reacted very, very quickly in COVID and did an awful lot of good things. We didn't get everything right, but as a country, we were an exemplar in terms of what we did do and that it takes an element of risk. But the more we can be interventive than being reactive, and that includes forward planning for accessibility and reducing costs in the in the future. Brilliant. Thanks for Yeah, and I think that's a very strong and very clear message that um, it's going to cost you one way or the other, but the upfront cost of integrating these things into what we do is certainly on a broader societal and exchequer funding, uh, mm -hmm. ultimately probably money well spent. Um, yeah. Maybe to take that but, to yourself, but, Cormac, as well, in terms of the 
something like the census, because you could probably get a very significant proportion of the population without investing in accessibility. So again, the business case there and, and how you, particularly in terms of managing that, how, how do you convince your, your people to devote the right budget to ensuring accessibility, both of, I suppose, both at collection, as you say, and at um, by making the, the results available. I'd, I'd say, uh, bringing to that, that we're, we're perfectionists in the census. Um, we, we aim for 100% population coverage, not 99%, not 98%. That, that's the reason that the census is mandatory. No, it's it's not, you know, we, we, we see lots of queries coming into our, our query box at the moment asking why people have to do it. The reason why it is, is that, you know, the, the more you deviate from 100% population coverage, um, the less value the census is um, to, to all the users. And I think I can count every government department and almost every state agency in using census data. Um, I, I think for myself, a, a very good example is to think about the counterfactual. So say we don't have a census. So then organizations like the Department of Education, when they're figuring out where to make, where to put a school, um, the head where to locate the houses, the NTA, where to build roads, you're kind of going on a hunch, you're going on, or worse, you're going on which interest group shouts the loudest, which community group shouts the loudest. Without data, without, um, you know, kind of hard concrete facts about, in the case of the schools, where the 0 to 5 year olds may be, or where the younger adults that might in turn generate the 0 to 5 year olds are located, um, you really are kind of in the dark about where to locate a school. So, you know, that's why it's mandatory. That's why we strive for 100% uh, coverage. And I think we're, you know, we've been looking that we've been pushing an open door because, you know, so many government departments do use our data. Um, in, in terms of the, the budgets, the cost of the census over the, the it's usually a five-year project with COVID, it's a six-year project this time around, is around about 70 million. We won't know until it's finished um, because we're going through the biggest expenditure phase at the moment, which is the uh, the payment of the numerators. But roughly half of that is used to pay the numerators and the field staff, which is a huge, uh, huge single investment. But as I mentioned during my presentation, you know, that's critical for accessibility. Um, you know, that is one of the challenges of 2027, as we discussed, but focusing on 2022, you know, having a field uh, the field staff that's going to knock on every single door and be that point of contact, that interface with the census, with the government, if you like, is really important. And the accessibility aspect of that to ensure the 100% population coverage is, is critical. Thanks, Cormac. Yeah, and I think what, what you're really saying there is, look, the job just isn't done right. If you haven't got the coverage, and you're not going to get the coverage without the accessibility. So it's it's absolutely in quite similar in some ways to what Catherine was saying about the fact that um, you know you either spend it or you or you don't do it properly. Um, Marie, you want to come back in there? Yeah, and I was just going to say, you know, I mean, the information that Cormac's um, the CSO gives to us. Uh, to decide our health planning like, as population-based health planning is so essential. And even if we were to look, and Catherine will back me up on this, if you were to look at poverty, for instance, they say the most impact on health is health inequalities, which goes back to our ability to, I suppose, our basic needs to have heat, you know, lighting <laughs> and accessibility. And, and the census gives us that data so that we can focus on maybe that there needs to be two primary care teams in that larger population base, or that in the rural area, it needs to be one that's more, uh, you know, dispersed and has satellites. Do you know what I mean? So I think that information is really essential to all of our services and, and, and inputting the money and investment in that prevents person going in. And just as a really very practical thing, if someone is to go into a nursing home, it's 1600 a week. If someone is to have a home care package with somebody at home, it's probably less than 700 euros a week. That's a huge difference. Now that's just keeping somebody at home. So, like, if we really invest in being healthy and well and a working population, you know, we're talking about this a population in imbalance that's coming for us, for those of us who are due to retire in a couple of decades time. Do you know what I mean? And the younger population are going to have to keep us going. You know, we it, it, this is the information that allows us to, I suppose, access what Catherine is trying to do. It's not about it's about us living our lives to the fullest. Doesn't matter what age we are. Thanks, thanks, Marie. And I have to say, yeah, the the definition of what it means to be old changes very rapidly from year to year. I find so. I'm delighted that most of us have a few decades left to go to retirement. I'm, Absolutely. 
I've got to look differently into the mirror tonight. Uh, Maria, how about just looking at the questions that are coming in from our participants? Question for you. Um, while I have you there, question for Maria. Yeah. I would love to hear about the ways in which services are engaging with users apart from directly with individual services users about their own needs. OK, so for instance, now there's a whole focus in the HSE where, where have, we have a new policy framework coming out um, just around the whole area of engagement with, with, say, service users. But if I was to take two services, for instance, one service at the moment, like the CAM service, it's our, you know, our child and adolescent mental health service. They engage with kind of the families. OK, so there's family case conferencing. So that would be kind of direct. So the indirect piece is they would have young people and parents on the development of the service in areas. So our senior decision makers would sit down and have them. And we now have a lot of patient advocates sitting on a lot of our senior management decision making groups around services. The hospitals are the same. I know my own hospital in Mayo <laughs> and I know our general manager there is very passionate about this. We have a patient a council who come and sit in and and they advise the senior management of the hospital around what it is that's happening. And there's volunteers in the hospital. There's even people then, you know, that engage. So that it's 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 not it's not just the one to one. However, the research that's coming back is people still say the most important engagement is the one to one. So, you know, no, because you have to enable people to sit at these decision making tables as well. Just like Catherine said, it can't be tokenism just having somebody there nodding and, and you just, just to, if I can maybe just pull that together a little bit, because obviously yeah. all of those conversations happen at a certain frontline interaction. And obviously this is a real leadership challenge to the individual public servants having those conversations is it's how do we kind of pull those insights together and harness them into like organizational change because you're dealing with something as vast as the hse and there are conversations in people's kitchens about their needs so like mm -hmm. what have you got in terms of organizational mechanism that actually pulls that together okay so i suppose that, and, and that's where this change guide and the framework that we have is kind of really important for us it's about building up that organize that there's organizational learning that's required. So storytelling is really important and collecting the stories and collecting the lived experiences. And a lot of the professions now, you know, whether even in medicine as well, they're looking at sharing kind of, well, you know, when they sit down to review their clinical practices, it's around the story of a patient's experience. Do you know what I mean? So we have things like Schwartz rounds. I don't know if you've heard of these. These are kind of in our hospitals. And it literally, you might have, instead, it wouldn't be a consultant that would lead the Schwartz round. It might be the healthcare assistant who will lead the Schwartz round in that ward for that particular day based on her experience working with the patients that she's caring. So there's we have a lot of, we'd say, quality improvement and service initiatives happening so that we can capture those stories and engage the leadership at, the, at right down at ward level, right down at primary care level, but that that story can go up to the decision maker, whether it's the chief executive officer of a hospital group or the community health organization, so that they can learn that it's not just, can I say, the adverse events that gives us the learning, mm. but it's also the good practice stuff that gives us the learning that we can build on. But of course, that doesn't sell headlines. <laughs> it know it doesn't sells. worry, but it, it is so service. much to the heart of what we all do, and whether that be in the health yeah. services or in the front line of DSP yes. or even a revenue yes. office or whatever it is. I think yes. it's it's just that piece that and I think it's it's you know just thinking across the 60 plus organizations represented here today, that that ability to create those mechanisms that actually get those and I think stories as you put it is a really wonderful way to put it. Um mm -hmm. that we actually tap into those stories um so that you're not repeating the same issues um exactly. because that head office or center or whatever it is isn't picking up those learnings and, and reconfiguring the service delivery 
to, to maximize the benefit. Um, so that's again a really powerful learning. Listen, thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, I mean, and it's really it's 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 down to my terrible chairmanship. Um, but we're we're kind of hitting the buffers on time again this afternoon. Um, because we've had three really fascinating presentations, and I think there's some critical themes coming out from them around the trust, the communication, that listening with respect piece. And I think that's just that last piece we was just touching on is, is how to turn the listening into organizational reality by actually getting those stories back into how we actually design our service. And some of those frameworks that you've all been talking about, and obviously these slideshows will be available through the network facilities. Um, and I'm going to just invite Nora in to talk a little bit about that in a second, but I think that's going to be really valuable to our membership just to to be able to beyond this afternoon's conversation to pick up on that stuff. So again, thanks again so much. Um, Nora, can I just invite you in there? First, there is that piece about how people follow up on all the information they've got this afternoon, but I know beyond that as well, you would like to share a query that's come in from one of the network members. Yeah, thanks, Brian. So um, as always, we'll be uh, we've recorded and we'll be sharing the recordings with with you all, with all the members, and we'll be sharing the presentations as well. Um, we did just have a query come in recently from one of our network members around a uh, customer feedback system. So very uh, related to what we've just been discussing there. How do you get those stories? How do you get that information back from customers? Um, and use that feedback then to um, to design and deliver better services. So I suppose we're all aware of surveys and things like that, but moving into more innovative space, if you're aware of any particularly innovative approaches out there that you might be using in your organization, we'd love to hear about it. Um, so if you want to post, you can post on the um, collaboration forum tool for the QCSN, or else you can email us directly and we will collate all of those responses and share them with the network as well. Well, so just to have a think about it and maybe give us an email if you're aware of any interesting um, customer feedback systems in your organizations. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nora, and I'm sure you'll all be familiar with Nora. I didn't even introduce her because Nora has very much at this stage become the face of the QCSN to all of you and she does fantastic work. Um, in between these events and just staying in touch with the network members and encouraging people to share their information through the, the website. And I think that's really important. An, an event like this afternoon is enormously valuable and it just gives that opportunity to showcase some of the best examples. But there are many examples and there are many tools and techniques that we can share with each other through that. So um, I just urge everybody to stay in touch with Nora uh, in between these quarterly events um, because there's, there's a huge amount that we can all do to support and manage each other. Just to, to a thought sort of runs to me to sort of reflect on a lot of what we've been talking about this afternoon, but maybe particularly on, on some of what Catherine was saying to us. Um, came across a fascinating report there recently about um, a campaign that brought real change in the banking sector in Spain, uh, but run under the heading of, and pardon my Spanish because I don't speak it, but soy mayor, no idiota, which roughly translates as I'm older, I'm not stupid. Um, and like a lot of, um, and again, I'm conscious that I will not use the word elderly, that a lot of more mature citizens were finding the jargon and the type of service delivery that the financial services industry was giving to them were just impossible to access and to work with. But they collectively campaigned through their representative bodies and through the government services. And there's now a significant shift in how financial services are delivered in Spain, recognizing that. So there's, there's power in that. But I think for us as public servants, we don't want to have to wait to have this kind of campaign come and bite us on the backsides. We want to do it ourselves and do it proactively and do it right. And again, I think the, the benefit of this network is hugely around that. And I think as I kind of you know mentioned at the beginning and the fee focus of a lot of our work on the network is that kind of inflection point that I think we're at as a public sector globally, but in Ireland in particular, I think where digital has become that huge leap forward. And it brings, as I said earlier, those dangers with it that we leave sectors behind. The solution is something that I think all of our speakers have talked about this afternoon, that concept of co-creation, that concept of actually working with 
whether it's people with healthcare needs, whether it is people who are going to deliver core vital information through a census, or whether it is people in different age cohorts, it's working with people, listening to them, listening to them respectfully, and having those mechanisms then to pick up those stories and channel them back in. And again, those mechanisms, and I think that's something that there's scope for a lot of dialogue within this network about and to continue to share those and that query that Nora has just been putting out about the feedback mechanisms, because the stuff we get it. We have heard again this afternoon some terrific examples of how it's done, but each organization has to then build their own mechanisms to support the the activation of that to, to pick up those learnings and not just to pick them up because that's half the battle. It's then to, in a very practical way, turn those into how we design and deliver our services. So again, I just want to, to wrap up. Um, first of all, to say that this afternoon has been recorded. Um, I hope all our speakers were aware of that before they started, um, but certainly it has been recorded and the recording will be available on ops.gov.ie. So any of your colleagues out there who wanted to attend, but got, and I know all our lives are so busy that very often you don't get to attend the thing you wanted to, the recording is there. Uh, and all of the resources will be available as well on that site. I also want to say a huge thanks again to three really fascinating speakers who gave us excellent presentations, Cormac, Catherine and Marie. And if we were doing this in the non-virtual, we'd have a tremendous round of applause at this stage. Unfortunately, it's not possible, but I think you all know that it's well earned. Um, so well done again, and thank you so much. Also again, to say a huge thanks to, to Grace O'Regan from Deeper, who sort of drives an awful lot of this work to Nora, who's at the center of making it all happen and quiet man in the background who also makes this afternoon happen to Owen, who's been taking care of the sound and vision to ensure that we had such a seamless event this afternoon. So thank you all again very much. Our next QCN event will be on Tuesday, the 7th of June. Um, put that in your diary for now and we'll be in touch with you very soon about the themes and topics for that date. Thank you all very much.